even if you don't get it quite right, it's still going to be bigger than 2 to the minus 1. This is a very big number, CN. So it grows much faster than the exponential. But what I want to show you, it's something related to this problem. N not exactly the problem in the homework, but something related to it. Um, you don't need this to do the problem. Okay? What I'm going to say now, it's not the solution to the problem. What I want to show you, it's something that you're going to see a lot in the algorithms course. Okay? Which is to say, how can I think of parentheses of five objects? A, B, C, D, E. So, kind of like induction when, if I know how to think of P of n, how do I think of P of n plus 1? You see, when you do algorithms in computer science, you sometimes don't want to treat problems mathematically. You want to think in terms of construction. How do I get there? Because the computer has memory and CPU and registers and all that. You have to find a path to construction to the solution. Mathematics sometimes says there exists a value that does something. But I can prove to you some theory that's something. That's all very good to know that, but it's not something that we can program a computer to do. When we attack problems with computers, with algorithms, we want to find constructive ways to get at the solution. So I want to think of C of n plus 1. I want to I figure out how can I compute the number of ways to put parentheses on five things, <coughs> assuming I already know how to do four objects or three or something, just like the induction way. That's what, that's what induction does, right? It, the principle of induction is can you solve the problem for n plus 1 assuming you solve all the previous problems in the past, p1, p2, pn. So how can I think of this? Really what I want to do today is just an idea that's going to be fundamental for a bunch of algorithms you're going to study later on. Right? How can I think of this pn plus 1, assuming I know how to solve smaller problems? Like if I get down to three objects, or two objects, or four objects, I know in how many ways I can put parentheses. Yes? Like a summation of, like if you break, if you break them into like small terms, like summation of like three. I don't even want to go to summation. Let's just get the, the first <coughs> idea that you see. I need to break this up. That's the point, right? I have this problem of five things. And what he's saying is, what if I break it up here? Break it up means there is a natural breakup. Because if you think of multiplication, for each one of those things, there is a last multiplication that's happened. What's the last multiplication here? Uh, a. a times the rest. What's the last multiplication here? What's the last multiplication here? D times, D times D. There is always, when you put parentheses, a last multiplication that happens. So let's assume that multiplication, the last multiplication is this one. I put parentheses somewhere in here and somewhere in here somehow, but the last multiplication in this particular way of putting parentheses happened here. Now, I have a bunch of ways to put in parentheses on the left side and a bunch of ways to put in parentheses on the right side, right? I already know how to solve those problems, so-called sub-problems. That's how we're going to call it in algorithms, sub-problems, right? So if I, know, if I know that the last multiplication is here, so say I'm going to say this <coughs> equal uh, 2, that's, that's where the last multiplication happened. Last multiplication. In this case, in how many ways can I put parentheses in here? This is a problem I already solved in the past. There's two objects. There is, uh, that's C1 for two objects. And in how many ways can I put parentheses here? That be C2, that's for three objects. What if this breaks up not in here, the last multiplication is not here, but suppose I want to break it up as in A, B, C times D, E. That's K equal 3. In how many ways can I now put parentheses on the left side? That's C2 times C1, right? So my point here is that if I have a bunch of objects, A1, A2, up to A, N plus 1, to multiply, what I have to do is first put the last parenthesis 
last multiplication at some point k, and then say, well, I know how to solve this problem, and how many ways can I put parentheses here? <coughs> well, if this is k objects, the last one here is k, and the next one here is ak plus 1, this is going to be ck minus 1. Right? And how many ways can I put parentheses here? And in here, in how many ways can I put parentheses here? How many objects are here? Okay. This is uh, n minus k plus 1 objects, maybe? So there'll be c of n minus k ways to put parentheses. This way of thinking is going to be fundamentally solving these kind of problems with a computer. Why is it ck minus 1? Here? Yes. We said for four objects, we have C3. Right. Oh, I see. For six <coughs> objects, is C5. For K <coughs> objects, is going to be K minus 1. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So this has to do a lot of the structure of the problem. This problem has a structure. It says, if you want to put parentheses of N plus 1 objects, all you have to do is decide where you do the last multiplication, this times that. That's, the la that's <coughs> one decision you have to make. And there are many ways to set that last multiplication. It could be here, it could be here, it could be in many places. And then once you decide that, that that's your last multiplication, this is a problem we solved before. It's a smaller problem. And this is a problem we solved before. And then it comes down to counting. Is it true that any parenthesization here times any parenthesization here gives me a unique parenthesization for the whole thing? Is that true or not? It's true, right? Because now that I fix this k, anything here times anything here will be a unique way to put parentheses. And using the structure of the problem that I can solve it, like divide and conquer that we talked about last time. We solve it, we break it into subproblems. We solve the subproblems, how many times how many, and then we put it back together. Now what he said at the end, he said it's going to be a sum. Cn is going to be the sum over this k of something. Because for every k, I have a different ways to put parentheses, no matter what I choose to break up initially this string. That's why it's a sum. There's k equal 1, k equal 2, k equal 3. And inside the sum is in how many ways can I put parentheses left and right given where it broke. Now, this is the right way to think about this problem in general. For your homework, you don't need this because the homework has such a loose bound that 2 to the n minus 1 is so weak that even if you do something very, very simple, very naive, you still get it to work. <coughs> the Catalan number is much bigger than 2 to the n minus 1. That's the thing. If, if we put a, a correct bound in there, not 2 to the n minus 1, but something with factorials, then we need a better thinking. But I want to give you an idea of how people solve these problems. Look at the problem break it up into smaller problems. That I, the, the best way to break it up is into problems that I already solved, like in here. A matter what objects are, right? The number of parentheses for k things will be the same no matter what the k things are, right? We all, are, we all see this, that if this is 2 times 3 times 4, or it's some matrices, in how many ways can I put parentheses? It doesn't matter what these objects a, i, are here. Who's following me? Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this problem, um, just to, to make it clear what the problem is asking, what the Catalan numbers so on and so forth. But we really need to move on to something like graphs. That's our last topic. Graphs are a very big deal in both mathematics and computer science and many problems. So um, in graphs, we usually have a bunch of uh, nodes. So these are nodes and edges between them. Uh, for example, let me see here. I don't know. 
here's a graph. Um, there are many, many natural examples of graphs. You have to think of, of this as some sort of object and the uh, edges between them as connections. So nodes are objects of interest and edges are connections or relations between them. So for, I'm going to put the first example up. If the nodes are cities, so this is Boston, New York, Dallas, San Francisco, Los Angeles, so on and so forth, what would be a natural edge between those cities? Hmm? Flights, distances, maybe relationships like this is uh, close to that or the same as that or it's the same region or something like this. What other examples we have? If the nodes are people on Facebook, what would be the edges? Hmm? Friends, right? What else? What? Let's try to find some more graph examples. If the nodes are Wi-Fi routers, what's the connection between them? There's a network connection between them, right? Or cell towers. So the cell phone towers, which ones are connected to which? Right? You had you had some idea in mind? Yeah, I was going to talk about like if they were like methods in like a program. Or, like, sure. If there these are programming language paradigms or methods. Uh, which one of them are, are, you know, part of the same family or something like this, right? There are many natural graph examples. If those are courses that you take with your, you know, within your degree, those would be maybe prerequisite requirements. Although, for to have prerequisites, right, suppose these are the courses that you're going to take. For having an edge a prerequisite, I need to do something with an edge. There's a special part, particular type of edge that I need to make it a prerequisite. CS 1800, this course, it's <coughs> a prerequisite for, say, algorithms. What, what do I need to do with this edge in this case? Put an arrow because, uh, because prerequisiteness is not a reciprocal property. If this is a prerequisite for algorithms, it's not like the algorithms is a prerequisite for CS 1800. So sometimes we have, uh, like in here, this is an undirected graph. Edges are reciprocal. But sometimes we have a directed graph where an edge is uh, some sort of u to v. This is u to v connected. This is u from v, but not necessarily v from u. So if I add, if I add, uh, edges here, I make a directed graph out of. It. Uh, I I can have. So many properties on the graph theory, you can spend a lifetime learning about graphs, okay? So, uh, let me see here. We're going to say V is the set of nodes and E is the set of edges. We can think of edges as pairs UV of nodes. An edge is simply, you have to say, a source and a destination. In here, um, I could write for this graph, I could say the set of vertices is A, B, C, D, E, and F. And the set of edges is A, C, B, C, a, D, C, D, uh, we already put B, C, B, F, D, F, D, E, and F, E. It's a set. 
So that's a way to say I have those vertices and I have those edges. Again, in many problems, you're not going to talk necessarily about nodes and, and edges. You might talk about cities, about people, about courses, about assembly pipelines, you know, economic products, whatever. The, the graphs can model a lot of things, connections between them. Um, so I can also talk about degree. Node degree is the number of edges incident in that node. So in an undirected graph, so the edges, I ignore the arrows or I don't put arrows at all. What would be a degree, we're going to call it DAG, degree of D if the graph is undirected? How many edges are incident in here? Four. How about in uh, B? Two edges. But if it's directed, there is two things. There is out degree. Uh, the, the edge is leaving from that node. So out degree of D. How many edges are leaving from here? Two. And the in degree of D is how many edges are coming in to D? Two. And uh, let's do the same for C. Out degree of C, we, how many things are leaving from C? One. And how many things are going into C? Two. So if we talk about a directed graph, we have to split the degrees into in degree and out degree. Why would the, for the undirected graph, why is the no degree to B just two? There's two edges on B, right? Oh, okay. oh, is, so is there not one that jumps A to B? No, okay. there's no edge here. So what's the out degree for node B? How many edges are living from B in a directed graph? Two. And what's the in degree? How many <coughs> edges are coming into B? Okay. Uh, we can also have uh, a path, a path from a node U and a node V. So U, U and V are nodes <coughs> or vertices. I should say this very clearly. Many people don't use the word nodes. They use the word vertices. Nodes or vertices, same thing. Uh, a path from U to V is a sequence of edges starting in U and ending in V. So do we have a path from A to F? Can we find a sequence of edges to start in A and end up in F? Yes. yes. That would be what? <laughs> AD and then DF. <clears throat> That's a sequence of edges that I start in A and end up in F. <clears throat> now, some people call, when you, when you see the notation, uh, the typical notation is to say the edge is AD like this. That's an edge. And then you have the other edge, DF. That's OK, too. You can, you can put it either way. In, in, in this class, I don't want to be very formal. You might see a notation of edge that's AD or AD like this. Either way, it means the same thing. It's the edge from A to D. Now, if this is directed, <coughs> is there a path from F to A? In 
a directed graph, can I start in F and end up in A? No. But if it's undirected, is there now a path from A to A? From F to A? Yes. In fact, in an undirected graph, if there is a, a path from here to here, obviously there's a path backwards from here to here. It's the same path. <coughs> if it's an undirected graph, everything I do one way, I can go the other way because edges don't have arrows, right? Yes. The path from A to F will be the reverse <coughs> of the path from Again, in an undirected graph, everything I go one way, I can go backwards. There's no, no uh, arrows on these edges. When we have a directed graph, very important, any edge can be only going in the direction of the arrow. So if for whatever reason we have a flight from B to C, but no flight from C to B, which is quite possible, then everything we do with the graph on an edge has to go in the direction of the edge. That's the whole point of the app. Um, so, existence of a path from U to V means V is reachable from U. You're gonna maybe here, this terminology, this word, it depends what you're doing. If you're doing a lot of networking, for example, when the nodes could be routers or and the edges are how network packages flow between those nodes, then you're going to hear this term reachability a lot. You know, can I reach from here to here? Also, trade networks. Uh, now, now, trade is a little different than before, but if you think of early empires like the Roman Empire and the Mongol Empire, the Egyptians and all that, trade networks. Uh, had uh, uh, you can easily see why an economy of these early empires work if you look at the graph of the trade. What city sells what to what other city? And reachability was a big deal. Uh, if if you if you know history, the reason Mongols made it made it so fast and so 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 big is that they imposed a trade network that had little obstacles to realize. Uh, they had their own you know, ways to do that. But if, if you guys know what I'm talking about, the Mongol Empire being so big, how did they manage to have such a big empire prosperous you know, a thousand years ago? The reason was their trade network was very vast and nobody put up with them. <clears throat> Other empires suffered this you know, very quickly. They couldn't expand the trade networks and therefore they collapsed. Many, many things can be models with, with graphs. Now, let's go further a little bit in that example. If I am to model a trade network, I say this city trade to that city, it makes sense to quantify this edge. Right? To not just say, okay, there is an edge, there is a route, there is a trade route, this city <coughs> can sell to that city, that's fine. I should also say something like what? There's a quantity that matters on this trade route, which is, you guys, Anybody study economy in 101 high school? What's important in a trade route? If, if, if you look at the city that sells stuff to another city, or two companies if you don't like cities, doesn't matter, people trade, right? What's important in that trade? How much, right? So it makes sense to say uh, that's 100, right? It sells a lot. Well, this is only, you know, 11, and this is 17, and this is uh, 58, and this is, uh, this is losing money, this one. This is minus 20, <coughs> and uh, this is uh, 5, and this is 8, or, you know, 18, something. So sometimes edges have values associated with them. In a trade network, perhaps the biggest, the, the most important value is how prosperous that, how much money you make on tra that trade route. And if you are a macroeconomist, 
today or a thousand years ago, if you are the, like the guy responsible for the treasury for the Mongol king, you care a lot about those numbers. You don't care who's the guy on the trade and what exactly they sell. What you really care is how much money are being made on that trade. Today is the same thing. When you hear candidates, you know, Trump and Clinton discussing trade routes and this is all these issues in the campaign. A lot of that has to do with how much is to be made on trade routes. Nobody will care on a trade route that makes no money. The whole deal of this Pacific trade has to do with the amount of money being made on these trade routes. What if those are cities uh, and this is distance? These are roads, not trade routes, but roads. What would be this value? Well, it makes sense to put here. Distance. What if those are flights? What would make sense to put here? If those are the flights between cities, what would be a good number to put on an edge? What? Right, but the distance doesn't matter when you take a flight, right? Do you really pay attention to, when you book a flight, do you pay attention to how many kilometers are there? Time. Time or cost seems like the, the two things that you really care. When you book a flight, you care about how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost. Anybody looks at how many miles are in there? I, I don't think so, right? So you see, for many problems, there's natural quantities on the edges, depending what you want to model. Uh, how about if those are Wi-Fi routers or, or you know, some network, uh, big network points? What would be a good, a good number to put on the edge between two network hubs? Speed is it's not exactly what we measure between two routers. Yeah, there's a name for that, carry limit. How do we call that carry limit in networking? Bandwidth. bandwidth. Between two network routers, it makes sense to put up the bandwidth, right? Some people call that speed uh, because, you know, we stay at home and we say, what's your speed? What's your download speed, right? What's your upload speed, right? You have files, I have Comcast, you know, what's better speed? That's not speed, that's bandwidth. How much can you get, okay? Speed is more like, in, in, a, in a physical sense, if I sent an email to China, how long is going to take to reach China? Because you have to go through many network hubs and hoops and fiber optics and so on and so forth. Presumably, we don't care about those things today. We assume e emails get sent instantaneously. It won't matter if it's in China or in New York. But speed uh, means more like how, how, how smooth the traffic goes, not the bandwidth, which is how much stuff can you get. Okay? So it, it does make sense. To, to put sometimes number on these things. And uh, unfortunately, for computer scientists, putting numbers here complicate a lot of algorithms. You know, we, we're gonna see that in a second and maybe a Monday. Okay, so before we get into it, we need to represent this graph. <coughs> I, I show you a picture here, and uh, my picture relies on circles for the nodes and segments for the edges. But how do I write this on a computer? How do I write nodes and edges with a computer? There are um, two representations. More than two, but we will do two, which is uh, a DHNC. Matrix. I'm going to take that thing and say, uh, here's A, B, C, D, E, F, and here's A, B, C, D, E, F, right? That's my matrix. And this matrix, it's going to have 1 and 0. So in this matrix, I only have 1 and 0. I think uh, of the <coughs> rows being the sources and columns being the destinations. Do I have? an edge from A to, to B? Um, no. That's a zero. How about A to C? Yes. How about A to D? Yes. A to E? No. How about A to F? No. So every cell here 
this matrix of this is seed from A to D. This this value here is A. In the matrices, we typically write the raw index first and then the color. This MAD is one if there is an edge, AD zero if not. Uh, let's do another one. How about C? C to A, there is an edge. C to A. Exactly. We have to decide from the beginning whether we treat this as a directed or indirected graph. If if I say it's directed, do I have an edge from C to A? No. No. If I say it's undirected, do I have an edge from C to A? Yes. Yes. So if it's, I'm going to say here, directed, C to A, there is no edge. C to B, no edge. C to C, I'm going to leave that blank for a while. C to D, C to C, <coughs> C to F. I'm not going to fill the whole thing, but you can see how this goes. If it's undirected, in an undirected graph, what's going to happen between MUV and MVU? If, if, if this is an edge, either 0 or 1, edge or no edge, right? It has to be equal with VU. Because if there is an edge from U to V, Automatically, there's got to be an edge from V to U right? for every node you read. So, what matrices have this problem? How do we call a matrix that has this particular problem? Inverse. No. Transpose. Close. There's a name. It means we, if, we, if we flip it over the diagonal, we get the same exact matrix, right? Oh, triangle. Tri not a uh, you guys have the right concept in mind. Uh, the inverse uh, of transpose does something, but there is a name for a matrix that has every element symmetric? here is the same as what? Symmetric? Yes. So if, if I have an undirected graph, the adjacency matrix has to be symmetric because whatever value is from U to V, edge or no edge, or sometimes we put these values in the in the adjacency matrix, then the same thing has to happen from B to U. So what if I build that matrix? Um, Edge weights, so I'm going to do the same thing. A, B, C, D, E, F. A, B, C, D, E, F. But now, whenever there's an edge, A to C, I'm not going to write one. I'm going to write the edge weights. What's A to C in there? 11. Whenever there's no edge, I'm going to still write the zero. A to D will be minus 20. <coughs> B to A. 0, B to B is 0, B to C, that will be a 17, B to F, that will be, uh, what, 100? 0, 0. Let's do C. C will go to B, so that is uh, 58. C, that's the only one. If I do this, what's the problem? Um, I'm going to do one more, F. F goes to E, that's 18, and then nothing else. If I do this, there is a problem here. I'm confusing two things, two concepts. So in this, in this matrix here, I have a very clear definition of what a 1 means. 1 means there is an edge. What's a 0? Uh, okay, how can I, I, why is this wrong? 
can have a natural integer. Correct. This is wrong because zero is confusing. Either it could be a no edge or an edge with weight zero. So in some problems, that's OK. In some problems, you specifically want to say, if there is a zero edge, that's, I don't put it. I, don't, I leave it as no edge. If that's the definition of not an edge, like the edge has the weight zero, it doesn't matter to me, that's OK. But that's a very typical mistake people do, not just in graphs, to say, OK, uh, I'm going to put zeros. And then later on, I'm not going to know. Are those zeros really edges of weight zero, like, uh, say, a trade route that makes as much as it expends, so it's like zero? Or zero means there is no trade route at all. Okay. Uh, so sometimes we have to use the, those values, the fake values, to indicate something. We got to be very careful about this kind of thing. The same thing happens in machine learning or data mining when people have those features. Every, every patient comes with all kinds of features like lab tests and diagnosis and all that. And sometimes if there is no, no lab test or no feature for a patient, they put a zero. But then later on they don't know the same exact problem. This patient, is it true that it, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, its value was really zero of the test or there was no test? You know, it's the same confusion problem. I see a zero, and I'm wondering if that's actual value or it's just a fake value indicating there was no taste, there was no trade. How can we solve this problem? We don't want to be confused about those things. We still like to have some values here because it's a matrix, a numerical matrix in the computer memory. How can I, yes. Right. So the solutions would be either pick a, <coughs> a value out of range for missing links. Usually, zero is not a good value out of range. Many ranges naturally include zero. Like, think about making money. Making money, zero obviously is, a, is an important value. But for some things, obviously I can handle value that's not reachable. Suppose these are ages of people or something like that. How about I put an age of minus you know, 9 million? That's not a possible age of a person, not minus 9 million. So I would know that's <coughs> an age, right? Uh, what if, uh, uh, I don't know, those are distances. Can I find some sort of distance that's not a distance in range? So I put that value, I will know. That road is blocked, does not exist. I could put a negative value, right? Because all the distances are positive. Or the other option is to pick uh, something that's not even a value. You know, sometimes you see this NA, right? Mm -hmm. NA means not applicable to this problem, that does not exist. In a computer, this is a little bit of a problem. You know, computers don't understand NA. So, you know, if this is a numerical matrix in MATLAB, I mean, MATLAB understands NA, because now it used to not to, but be careful when you write this in a computer program, I'm really talking to the computer scientists right now. <coughs> There's no natural NA. You have to fake it somehow. What's NA, right? You still have to give it some fake value that in, you know it's NA, or an undefined value, or some null memory, or something like that to make this work. So that's the efficiency matrix. Uh, there is the other way representation. Which is adjacency lists. So in a DHNC list, I write each head A, and I say, um, in a list, I'll have something that's a neighbor of A, for example, C, and then I move to another element that's the next neighbor of A, D, uh, and then I move to 
there's any other neighbor over here? No. So I'm stopping right here. How about for B, if I'm trying to do this? The, the thing that I can reach from B are uh, C and F. How about for, um, say, D? D, I can reach E. and so on and so forth. I can write all of this. Um, how about E? Can I reach anywhere from E? Nowhere. I say that's no. Now, there's... Uh, I don't want to insist on this because you guys, some of you, didn't learn about lists. And that, that's a big danger here. I, I'm trying to teach you how to do graphs with lists, and some of you don't know lists. It's really useful to do lists before, which we can't. We don't have time for that. So this really makes a lot more sense once you study the data structure lists. The reason, the, one of the big problems here for, for somebody who just sees this is that this connection here, that's not an edge in the graph. Right? Neither is this. These, these arrows, those are not edges in the graph, right? I mean, this one is because E is reachable, but that, that doesn't mean there is an edge from C to F or C to D or anything like that. These are the construct <coughs> list construct, which we call sometimes list pointer or list connection. What this really is trying to do here is to say list for every node the neighbors, the, the reachable neighbors of that node. And to do it with a list, I need to, to have the, the linkage in the list. Or linkage. But this doesn't mean those are edges in the graph. So that's a big confusion point. That, that again, before you study lists properly, you may have a hard time doing that. Um, so, to make a list work, I need to have the content of, a, of the list node, that's the C or whatever. And then the list has to have this pointer structure, so it takes me to the next list uh, node or list object. That's what you're going to study <coughs> when you do this. What's the advantage of a list over a matrix? Why, why would I use a list sometimes? What? Right. In, uh, in, a in a matrix, I'll have to write all the columns here, even though node F has only one connection. Right? In F, I still write six values in a matrix for F, but there's only one connection. While in a list, the only thing I'll have to do is to say what? F goes to E. And nothing else. Maybe we should put here no to make it really look like a list. So the advantage of a list is that I only have to specify the edges. If there is one connection from F, I only put one element. While in a matrix, I have to still put <coughs> a lot of zeros here. Now, of course, there are ways to store matrices much more intelligent than this. There are ways to store matrices with something like lists. We call the sparse format representation that facilitates writing a matrix that has a lot of zeros in it. Many mathematical programs like MATLAB and Mathematica have built in sparse representation of matrices. So we don't have to write all these zeros. So we have that. We have list representation. And, um, and matrix representation. And this stuff is pretty easy. I mean, this stuff is really, really trivial. I'm sure any book, any Wikipedia page, anything you choose to read is going to just flow very, very natural. Um, the one thing that I want to do today, and the other one I'm going to do it on, on, And the other one, I'm going to do it on Monday, 
is to talk a little bit about graph traversal. Oh, one more thing related to the homework. I think you guys have a graph homework problem. Um, the notion of a click. Click is a subset of vertices. Not all of them, just a subset. Uh, let's, let's just call it a click C included. B, with the property that for any two nodes in C, edge UV exists. So in a click, here's a bunch of nodes that forms a click. There's other nodes in the graph. These are the click <coughs> nodes. What does it mean to be a click? Within those click nodes, all edges have to exist. So this edge, this edge, that edge, that edge, this edge, and this edge. I have all edges between those vertices. It doesn't say anything about the other nodes. It only says that's a click if <coughs> all the edges exist. So if a click has size k, how many edges must be in that click if all edges have to exist? How many edges I, I have with, with K nodes? Maybe that's a common question, I, I don't know. But it's kind of, in an undirected graph, where edges have no arrows, it's pretty easy to tell how many edges have to be here, right? If there's K nodes, well, how many edges can I put on K nodes? How do we think of a counting problem? In how many ways can I can I pick an edge? I, I mean the concept, not the algebra. What does it mean an edge? An edge means two nodes, right? Number of edges will be number of ways to pick two nodes in the click. Because every two nodes correspond to an edge. So that gives the answer. Okay. Uh, the one thing that I want to talk about. Connections in this graph are this, this, A, F, this, this, What I want to do with the graph traversal is uh, essentially parts old nodes starting somewhere one node um, <coughs> so you're gonna re realize pretty quickly that yes uh, what does it say after graph versus graph node? first sorry uh, this so-called BFS 
the thing is, when I look at the graph, say I start in, um, say I start in, just to have the same thing as in the book, say I start in A. Start in A. Right here. Obviously, when I traverse this graph from A, I'm going to reach where? <coughs> I can reach B or where else? From A, where can I go? B, F, or D. When I traverse the graph, Think about it in a physical sense. I'm in A and I try to move somewhere. I can move either in um, B, F, or D. I'll have to make a decision. For example, suppose I choose B. So I'm in B. Now I have to choose whether I continue from B further or I say, no, no, uh, I move to F and D, right? So imagine I'm, I'm in here in A and I say, where can I go? I can go to B, so I go to B. Now I can go back to A and say, where else could I go? Well, I could go to F or I can go to D. Or I could say, no, no, wait, I'm in B here. Let's, let's continue exploring this graph from B. Those are the two main design choices when I traverse the graph. I either go first, I explore, you know, what's right next to me before going any, any deeper. If you play a game like Civilization or something like this, you know, explore the map, you are in a place, you have to choose, well, I'm going to explore my immediate neighborhood, like B, F, and D, or you say, no, no, keep going in one direction until you find the ocean. <laughs> Who's with me? Right? So there's two different philosophies for how to explore a map, if you like. One is to just explore from an epicenter, little by little, that's BFS. <coughs> the other one is, no, no, if I'm in B, keep going from B. That would be called DFS, and we're going to see it next week. So in, in BFS exploration, so BFS, A is the, the first place I start. What's the immediate neighbors? We call it, this is wave zero. Wave zero, what's wave one? What are the nodes immediately reachable from A? B, B F, and D. F, and D. What's wave two? Wave two is everybody which is reachable from wave one, within two steps. So I got A. I'm going to put the square on it. Now I got B and F and D. Uh, what's in wave two? I think in wave two I can, I can go everywhere else, right, in this graph. I can go to H. How do I go to H? B, F, H, or B, B, H, or A, B. H. I could go from B, right? So from A, I go to these guys. From B, I can go to H. <coughs> How about C? I can go from D, how about E? I can go from D, and how about I? <coughs> so say in I, I go from uh, So I could have gone in I from D, but in terms of traversing, I only care about one path, not all paths. So we call this the BFS tree, traversal. which is how reachable are those nodes starting from A by waves. The immediate reachable nodes are B of D, and then from these nodes I reach other nodes. Now suppose I have another node here, I'm going to call it uh, J here, and uh, that's reachable from C. Is J somewhere in part, in, wa in what wave would, would this J be? Right. Wave three. I'll have J, which is reachable from 
I don't want to put a node in wave three if it's reachable in wave two. So everything that goes in wave three, it must be that it's not reachable in one or two steps. Because if it will be reachable in one or two steps, it will be in wave one or wave two. Wave one contains everything reachable in one step. Wave two is everything reachable in two steps, but not in one. Wave three, everything reachable in three steps, but not in one or two. So J is in wave three here, because the only way to get there is A, C, J. Even if I have another H, H to J, that will still be wave three, right? Because the number of steps that will take me to get from A to J, I can go either A, B, H, J, or A, B, C, J, nevertheless will be wave three, because it takes three steps to get there. What if there is an H F to J? Now J is not in wave three anymore, although it's reachable in three steps, because it's also reachable in two steps from F. So if that's the case, J wouldn't be here. J would be here and will be reachable from F. Okay? Who's with me? Essentially in BFS is that the steps, the waves, are the minimum number of steps to get there. This case, J, is not in wave three anymore if it's reachable in two steps. That would be wave two. And if there is a direct edge from A to J, where would J be now? Where? One. Although all these other <coughs> edges exist, it will be in wave one because there is a direct edge from A. So that's BFS. BFS, it says start somewhere. What's the next immediate node? Dun, dun, dun. From here, where else can I reach? Dun, dun, dun. From here, where else can I reach? It may be that I, I may not reach everywhere. For example, there is another component of this graph, say K, L, M, and B. that's disconnected. Like there is no edge from here to here. Obviously, I can't reach those nodes, right? If I started in A, I reach those nodes in those waves. But then, how about those nodes? Those are unreachable. So this is unreachable from A. So I would have to write a different BFS, a different traversal component, start somewhere. Let's, let's say they are not uh, directed, to keep it simple, undirected. So I will have a second BFS for this. To, to be able to traverse the entire graph, I need to have a second BFS tree. Let's say start in L. So from well, where can I go? In wave one. I can go to K and T. And then in wave two, I can go where? M from? So I need to have a second BFS3 to cover this part, because there's no way to reach from here to here. There's no path from A to any one of these nodes. If I really want to traverse a graph, when I'm done, when I figure out, how do I know I'm done? Here, how do I know uh, there's no other nodes that I can reach? <coughs> I, I've got this, this stuff all the way in here, and I say, I want to know if there's nodes that I haven't reached. How do I do that? What? Cross them? don't want to go in cycles. So. Right, right. So cycles are a problem. But, but what I need to know here is where else can I reach, right? I can still try to reach from H. I say, uh, you know, I'm in H, I, C, E, and my last wave. Where else can I go from H? Well, H goes to F and B and J, but all these nodes are already in the tree. How about from I? Where else can I go from I? Do we have an eye here? 
I could go to D and F, but D and F are already in this tree, right? So how do I know I'm done traversing with BFS? Where everybody's connection, H, A, C, E, that's wave two. Everybody's connection, take C for example. I look, where can I go from C? D and E and J, all those nodes are already in the tree. So when I reach this state where everywhere I can go, it's already parsed, it's already traversed, I know I can't go anywhere else. If there's any other nodes than this in the graph, so I'll have to go back to the graph representation, the adjacency matrix, and say, hey, is there any nodes that are not in this tree? Yes, there are, right here. It means those are not reachable from my BFS traversal. I have to start another BFS somewhere in here to get those lines. Okay? So that's BFS, breadth first search. It checks first the, the, the immediate neighbor. So if you think of family, uh, those trees, family trees, right? Those are like BFS trees because the most connected people to you are your immediate family. And then the next connected to them are the second degree family and then the third degree family, so on and so forth. Uh, what, what else makes a good example of BFS? Where a natural traversal of the graph <coughs> is BFS. Facebook friends work that way, I think, right? The first <coughs> wave will be my immediate friends. Second wave will be the friends of those friends which are not directly my friends, so on and so forth. What else? What else works like BFS? How about when we browse the web? I thought that'd be a depth first. I'm asking. If I'm on a page, right? I'm reading about uh, orangutans. I'm I'm gonna click on something, right, to keep reading, right? So that's my first. I'm I'm on this web page here. By the way, if these are web pages, what are the edges? Everybody, if. If those are web pages, what's the natural edge between web pages? Link. Links, right? Are links directed or undirected? Links are directed. Because if there's a link from here to here, it doesn't mean there's a link backwards from here to here. Right? So if I if I read something and then I, I go to another page because I have an interest in there. Am I likely to continue on a <coughs> BFS or BFS way? Meaning, if I'm on, now on B, would I go back and go from somewhere else from A, or would I'm likely to go to H? I think that's a big uh, study in information retrieval, which some of you will take this class. It depends on the nature of the user, and the nature of the information that's being thought of. If I'm an expert at something, like say I'm a doctor and I'm specialized in diabetes, I'm much more likely to keep going depth. But if I'm, uh, you know, somebody who just discovered the topic and I, I, I'm looking for more like an overview of things, I'm not likely to go very deep into there, more likely to go back to the original page and check other immediate related things. Um, but related to this problem, so related to this problem, there's a picture. Here's the web graph. So the nodes are web pages, edges are links, URLs. <coughs>
Here's a, a, a simple toyish example with six wheel pages. <coughs> um, the edges are links, so the weights are binary. There's either a link or not a link. There, there is no wedge weight there. Um, and how many people know what crawling means on the web? Crawling. Hands up who heard of that, who has a notion of what it means. Crawling is, there's so much information out there, I, I'm a search engine like Google, I have to constantly update my indexes, right? So what do I do? I go from page to page and I check to see if the content has changed. Crawling is a natural BFS operation. So web, <laughs> crawl, natural BFS. Meaning, if I'm in a page, I just look at page uh, B here, I would go and check to see what's going on with pages F and E and D in a breadth for search manner, not in a depth for search manner. So crawling keeps this waving frontier of what I crawl already, like say, I already look at B, F, D, J, and now from here I can explore H, I, C, E. And then from there, I'll, exp I'll, I'll explore wave three. And to do this, we're going to need a data structure that you guys have to, to study in algorithms. Uh, it's called a queue. How many people learn about queues? Stacks and queues, right? Queues are essential for BFS implementation. We need to keep track of where we are to know where to go next. So in the web graph, uh, I want to, to talk about a different paradigm in here, a different type of problem, <coughs> which is to say um, how people navigate web pages. Right? So um, sometimes I'm going to talk about web page navigation, sometimes I'm going to talk about uh, graph navigation, which are the same things. I imagine myself visiting a page. And then from here, clicking on, on some, on some um, other page that's related, has a link from it. Right? That's how most people go and browse the web. They, they go read something, they found a link that's interesting, click on there, go to the next page. Okay? Whether those are Facebook pages or Wikipedia pages or other things, that's not. Now, I want you guys to do, this is a new concept, okay? To, we have to talk about two things. One, which is um, the idea of a random walk. <coughs> I, what I want to say, if, if I'm in here, I have certain probabilities to move. So the idea is that from B, uh, I can go with certain probabilities. On where can I go from B? F, E, and D. To and C. You're right. F, <coughs> E, D, C. That's one concept. Second, uh, and the most tricky one, the ones that most people have trouble with, is I don't want to think of one user browsing the web. It's one guy in there. Right? That's me. I can go there, 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 there. That's all good. I imagine myself at home on my computer. Hey, where is this guy going to go? How about I think and one shot of everybody? How many people are on the web at any given time? That's probably like 2 billion, right? So I want to think in here, there's not one user in B. There's 2 billion people somewhere in this graph. This graph is the whole web, okay? 
<laughs> right? There's the whole web. Everybody who's online right now, it's somewhere on some page. Everybody will move potentially to a next page. Not just me, Virgil, but everybody who's online. So I want to think in one shot of two billion people. We call this agents. So two, uh, a distribution controlling a large population of users. So again, I don't want to think of one person that says, if you are in this page, you know, facebook.com, where are you likely to go? What link are you going to click on? I want to say <coughs> there's two billion people spread somehow in this graph, and they're all going to move or click on some links. And three, memoryless chain of events. That is to say, anybody who, who moves from a page A to page B, the probability of going from A to B on a web page only depends on A, on being in A, and nothing else. So I want to say, everybody like me who's in page B has a certain probability of moving to C or to E independent <coughs> of how I got to B. Right? That's obviously not true. The reason I'm reading right now about Napoleon on Wikipedia may be different reason than somebody else reading about Napoleon. So my probability of moving here relates to the fact that I read about Napoleon, but I have certain other interests, and somebody else is also reading about Napoleon may jump with different probability to other pages. But it's a good model. However, there are situations where this really happens. You know those games, the strategy games, how AI thinks? You know, like things like StarCraft. Anybody play StarCraft in here or WarCraft? No? All these games are programmed this way. A computer makes a decision from one state to another. Those are computer states now. Based on that state alone, a computer has an understanding of the current state of the game. And based on that state, it makes some decision. Shoot, don't shoot, move, don't move, create, don't create, whatever. But those decisions are based on that state of the game alone. It doesn't matter how we got there. There's an entire history of how my hero got to this position or how my base got attacked, whatever. It doesn't matter. It only matters what's the state in the game right now. That's what memoryless means. This is a very, very important breakthrough in, you know, kind of science in general. The idea of memoryless chain of events. What depends on what? For example, given where you are in traffic, at what time, the fact that you're going to be late or not depends only where you've been five minutes ago, right? It doesn't matter how late or why you, you were late five minutes ago to your previous meeting, right? You know these schedules where I'm late and the more late I become, all the meetings get delayed. That's a memoryless type of process because once the meeting is late, independent of why or what happens before, <coughs> that's going to dictate what's going to happen to my next meeting. Same thing with bus waiting stops. Uh, same things in some cases with treatments. Doctors judge a patient and treatments of what's the state right now. We don't care. Most <coughs> doctors say it doesn't matter how you got to this place, to this state. They, they measure all everything you have right now. Given the state you are in as a patient, they decide what to do next. Not, they, they, don't, they don't depend that much on, on what, what, what happened to you to get to here. So this is something that if you go especially into AI, artificial intelligence and belief systems and gaming and, and you know, uh, so, sometimes stock market works that way, right? What happens to a certain stock 
has often depends only on the current situation. Some stock brokers think this way, right? I judge the things today, and based on what I see today, I make some decision. It doesn't matter what, so the Google stock right now is $750, say. Does it matter how we got to $750, or only matters that it's $750 today? If it only matters today that $750, no matter how we got here, that's a memoryless type of process. And these are much easier than the ones that are not memoryless. Because I only have to judge the current state. I don't have to judge the whole history of, of what happened to here. These are called Markov chains. Memoryless processes that everything in the future depends on the current state, not on how we got here. So web browsing, we model it as a Markov chain process. We say, you know, every user that's here has a certain probability of going here or here or here where the arrows are, independent of how we got to here, which is not quite true, but that's our model. So how do we think, what, what's the thing in here that matters? The task in here is to measure visit rate long term. In other words, to say, if I have 2 billion people distributed in this graph, yet web users <coughs> that are clicking on links, how many people would eventually visit C? Or, or what, what kind of proportion on hits I have on C versus on D versus on F versus on A, so on and so forth. If you're familiar with Google PageRank, anybody heard of PageRank? Right? PageRank is this kind of measurement. It's saying, I'm going to ignore the content that this is Napoleon, this is CNN.com, so on and so forth. I'm going to ignore what's on those pages. I'm only going to look at the links. I'm going to look at how dense this linkage is. And given that, I'm going to say some page seems to be very important, very likely to get hit, very likely for people to go there because it has a lot of links to it. <coughs> some other page <coughs> it's impossible to get hit because it has no links to it. So I can't browse to this page. I can only browse from this page back to the graph. So there's pages that nobody links to. Obviously, very few users will go here. Unless they know the exact URL to type it in the web browser and go there, there is no way to browse the web and click on a link to go here. So how do we think of this long-term visit rate? We're going to have to talk about this uh, more on, on Monday. That's one of the problems you have in the homework. It doesn't talk about the web graph, it talks about the mark of chain, but it's the same thing. <coughs> First of all, we need to say, here's a matrix P. That's a transition <coughs> probability. So the way this goes, I'm going to I'm going to write it as A, B, C, D, E, F. That's because I have here uh, six nodes. And A, B, C, D, E, F. And here's how I'm going to think of this. I'm going to say this is random, uniform. Uh, I look at B. Where can I go from B? I can go to C, D, E, and F, right? And if I go as a user, I click randomly on one of these four links. What will be the probability to go to C, D, E, and F? So for, for starters, B to go to A, I have a probability of zero. I can't go from B to A, right? And from B to B, I also have a probability of zero. I can't go. I would, need, I would need some sort of link like this to be able to go back to B. So that's not in here. But now I have four possibilities, C, D, E, and F. Suppose I choose one at random. 
what will be my probability to go now to C or D or E or F? One for very good. <coughs> How about from D? Where can I go from D? Can I go to A? Yes. So D here. I can go to A, to E, to C, and to F. Again, E, F, C, and A. So from D, I get one fourth zero, one fourth zero, one fourth zero. Let's take another one. Uh, what's going on with E? Where can I where can I go from E? Just nowhere. So A. So A will have how much chance? From E, A will have one. Everybody will have zero. How about from F? Where can I go from F? E or A. A, B, and E, right? So A, B, and E will get how much? One third. One third. <coughs> Who follow me here? Okay. So I, I assume in absence of somebody, give me, maybe there's some probabilities. Maybe somebody says this is 83% chance to move from here to here. <coughs> if I have those probabilities, I don't have to worry about them. But if I don't have them, I'm going to assume, you know, uh, this is random from whatever place. From A, for example, I'll have three probabilities, one third, one third, one third. In some problems, those problems are given, so I don't have to figure them out with uniform uh, random. But if they're not given, that's what I'm going to do. That's called a transition probability matrix, this one. The other thing that I need <coughs> is I need a distribution of agents in the graph. So my agents said, what I said is 2 billion, <coughs> 2 billion people browsing the web right now. Uh, I'm going to assume initial, I'm going to call this pi zero, that's some distribution of where those people are. How many, what percent of the users are in B, in A, in C, so on and so forth, right? So I'm going to say this is, for example, 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6, 1, 6. I'm going to say it's uniform. Of course, that's not true, right? If I'm to look right now on who's browsing what, pa what web pages, some web pages will have a lot more users than others. So I could say, no, no, that's not true. Let's put some other one. 1 over 2, 1 over 10, 1 over 20, so on. This is some initial distribution of people. Everybody <coughs> moves one. Step. One click, one link. So if my distribution of people looks in a certain way in the graph and everyone followed moves from whatever page they are on to the next page, what's the distribution after everyone has moved by one? after one move. What's the distribution after one move? So who's pi one of, say, B? How many people would be in B after one move? Who comes to B? Who can go to B? People from A. Yeah. Uh. People from F. People from anybody else? No. no. The people in B only come from A and F. So how do I know how many, what percent, what proportion will be in B after one move? I'm gonna say, well, that's gotta be the proportion 
the people from A, how many people were in A? That, that's the previous distribution, pi zero of A, right? That's how many people were in A before the move. But not everybody moved to B, right? If there were a million people in A, <coughs> not everyone from A moved to B. Out of all these people, who moved to B? I look at the transition matrix, you know? What's the chance of moving from A to B? A can go to B to where else? Uh, F. F. So C. A would have one half to and B. C. And C. OK, one third then. Yeah. One third, one third. And uh, where else can I go? In F? So out of the people who were in A, how many of them moved now to B? Who else came to B? People from? People from F. Right? So how many people were in F before times not, oh, not all of them moved to B? How many people from F moved to B? One third. One third. Before you guys go, let's do another note. Who's going to be in, uh, say, D? In D? Uh, How can I get from D, D to D? You go there from B and C. I That's get it. the previous people of C times what's the chance of moving from C to D? This uh, is the probability one, to move from C to D. One fourth. One fourth plus the previous people in where else can I get to D from? D. From where? D. D. Times what's the probability of moving from B to D? Um, so that's how I can compute the next probability. Of course, once I have pi 1, I can compute pi 2, which is after two steps. Being a memory-less process, Pi 17 will depend only on who? Pi 16, and of course the transition probability. Pi 17 will not depend on any other pi because it's a memoryless process. It's only what happened in the last stage that matters, not the previous stage. So this is almost enough for you guys to do the problem in the homework. You have to figure out how to compute this pi. That's the thing. We didn't get quite there yet, but we did enough for you to, to do that. So Monday, the first thing, we'll, we'll worry about how to compute this pipe. Uh, there is class on Monday. That's our last class, technically. But we will see you in here if you want to come for office hours next Thursday. <laughs>